A number of weeks ago, I had the privilege, uh, with some of you that were able to make it, to uh, be at and speak and give the message at Gary Lindsay's service of celebration. And I could go on and on and on about that opportunity, um, but it was really powerful for me, life-changing for me. Um, and I, those of you, I've been getting notes from people who say, you have no idea what Gary did for me years ago, how he walked with me, how he helped me. Man had a big heart, but he also had a big faith. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. So that card, there should be one on the table for every one of you, says Gary Lindsay at the top. At the bottom, we have a QR code with the message. It doesn't have the whole service, but just my message and of those of you that couldn't make it, I'm going to urge you, in the next day or two, please watch this. And then secondly, give this to somebody that needs it. Don't hoard it. Don't keep it. We've got probably, I would say, 30% to 40% of the men in the DFW area don't know God from Donald Duck. We all think because there are all these Bible studies and all these big churches all over, all the men are plugged in, ain't plugged in. So pass this to somebody whose literally life could be changed if they watch this, please. And that's Gary. Well, I have one more little thing we're going to do before we get started. And um, let me just say this about this crazy guy. He's the head baseball coach at Tyler Junior College. For 17 years, he's been in that post. He started when he was 25 years old. Uh, he's won the Coach of the Year nationally numerous times. He's won over the last 10 years five World Series titles. Uh, he has won over those years from 214 to 218 uh, four consecutive titles. His dad's with him today who lives in Arlington. Jim is his daddy. And I want you to give a rousing cheer to my good buddy, Doug Wren. Would you do that, Doug? <clears throat> was that a pretty good introduction? That was perfect. I want you to stand right much. here. That was too good. Yeah. Well, I want you to take three or four or five minutes and just tell them what's on your heart about our friendship and relationship and have fun yeah. doing it. Yeah. John, I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. John said I had five minutes. I'm a coach. So that what it'll probably take ten, but I'll try to squeeze it into seven. Why don't you sit How about down. that? Make yourself at home. Yeah. Squeeze it into seven. Uh, man, I'm so thankful to be here. Thank you for allowing me to be here and just be a part of this. John and I have been meeting um, every week. We spend an hour together via Zoom. Obviously, I live in Tyler, Texas, and um, what he said is true. I've been extremely blessed in my coaching career. I was able to take over at 25. Um, had no idea what I was doing. Very first year, we won 47 ball games, lost the national championship game in extra innings. And you're like, wow, this is, this is easy. Um, and then the next year, you don't. And then you, feel, you realize that you know, this is harder than it looks. And so I was very blessed. Had a lot of great, great teams. We get to um, 2014 rolls along, and we won our first national championship. And uh, life's good. And as a coach, that's, that's, how you, that's how you measure. That's the measuring stick of the year is your national championship. 15 rolls along and we had the best team in the country. By far, we lost seven games the entire year. One another went back to back. Or six, I'm sorry, 16 rolls along, same thing. Really good team, put it together. And win another national championship back to back to back, three-peat. Man, life's good. This is easy. I'm, I'm one of the best ever. <laughs> 17 rolls along and let's, let's make history. Why not? Four in a row, never been done. Still to this day, never been done. Four in a row in JCAA baseball. We rattle it off and um, we went four straight years and never lost a postseason baseball game. 18 rolls around and uh, we get to the national championship game again. Here we are. Nine innings away from being a five Pete, which is insane to think about. Um, and we lose in extra innings in that game. And I think for me, like, that was, a, that was an important part of my story because I grew up a believer. I grew up in a Christian home. I was really, I was really fortunate to be able to be surrounded by a family that, that valued that. But through coaching, I truly, the Lord, allowed me to win those things to get to this. 
Because I think for me is there was an, ex- an insane emptiness in that when I'm driving back after losing that fifth one, and now all of a sudden you're like, why am I good at this? And there's this back and forth, and there's just this insane emptiness in those, in those championships. God, there's got to be more. There's got to be something more. God really started stirring on my heart. It's really easy at our level because we recruit our players. It's very easy to be very transactional. And I remember hearing this coach one, one time that was talking about this transactional versus transformational mindset when it comes to, to coaching. And, and so I, I, wanted, I wanted more. I wanted more. I wanted something more out of my coaching. We, I'd run four in a row. I've been at the top. Why, Lord, why, why have you put me in this position? And so the Lord started stirring. And, man, he just started working in my life. The pandemic hit. And we got shut down, and obviously a lot of questions were being asked. And I think one of the things that pandemic at least revealed to me was that this, this life is short. If our world can stop on a dime, this life is but a mist, but a vapor. So I, was, I wanted something more. And I think for me, in my relationship with the Lord, like it was very lukewarm. Um, I was a baseball coach, that I, and I gave a little bit of Jesus to my, to my players. And I thought that was okay. I thought I was doing my part. And then I met John. Uh, we were invited to FCA uh, marriage event here in Dallas. My wife and I, we come over here. And I, the Lord had been stirring in my heart, like, you know, what does this look like? And I think for me, like, you know, I wanted to be able to share my testimony. I want to be able to share the gospel. But how? I'm not equipped. I don't know enough. We, we, the self-doubt, all this stuff sets in. Who am I to do that? I'm not a, that's, that's for pastors. And I met John. And so John, I had been, I had been, it had been on my heart to, to look at, to try to seek someone out for, for a discipleship purpose. I need someone to get me in the game. And to speak coach, I was sitting on the bench. I was sitting on the bench. So John and I, um, fortunately, he took me on. Um, I prayed about it. And we started meeting about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And the last year, has been an amazing experience from my standpoint as John is, has chosen to give me one hour a week through FaceTime. We laugh. We, we most of the time go over an hour. But he chose to give me an hour of his time. We go through his book, The Four Priorities. We rearranged you know, again, it's, it's just this overhaul of how I view life and the lens in which I view it through. What are my priorities? Where should they be? And then we talk about this term of disciple. And I'm sure he will mention that today. There's just this idea of a disciple, idea of, of not only just a learner of who God is, who he is, what he's done, but this idea of a follower this idea that he's commanded us to obey him, that if we love him, in John 15, it talks about if we, if we love him, or 14, if we love him, we will obey his commandments. So this idea that we, will, we are imitators of Christ. And then I think I understood that to a certain degree. I was kind of bought in halfway, halfway, but halfway in, halfway out. But, but the third definition of a disciple being a reproducer is something that I just never really thought was for me. And so here I am, I'm fortunate enough to be, I, I get 45, 18 to 20 year old guys that get to sit underneath my leadership and I have the opportunity to impact them and not only for their time in our program, but those guys are going to be scattered throughout the country. I've got guys all over the world in 18 years of coaching college baseball, there's guys all over the world. So what, what, a, what a great opportunity for me. Um, to take action. I've been on the sideline. I've sitting on the bench, and you can't impact the game from the bench. And that's my encouragement to you as John is going to be able to lay this out in front of you. I was fortunate enough to sit, sit with him for an hour a week, and he has changed my life. And what I didn't know, but he did, is that it doesn't just change my life, but my children's life, my wife, our marriage, those 45 guys that are under my leadership, my coaching staff, and now I'm over that now that I have leadership over, guys in my community um, that I meet with, everybody that I come in contact with, that he understands that this is not an addition problem, it's a multiplication problem. And so, John, I appreciate 
the last year and just um, your willingness to just sit with me and change my life and get me off the bench and get me in the game. Well, I'd say it this way. If I had 10 guys, 12 guys with a commitment of this guy, we'd turn the world upside down. So that's what you're looking at. And Daddy Jim, you did a great job as a daddy. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. Great guy. Thank you. Love you. That was perfect. Love you, too. Thank you. <clears throat> wow. I wish I would have had a coach like that when I was playing in college. Most of the coaches I had were so worried about winning, they really weren't really caring about you as a person to develop you to be a great man and how to be a great dad and a great husband and a great influencer of people around you. I wish I would have had a coach friend. And thank you, Doug. I appreciate that very much. Okay, well, Lord, be with us now. And I pray that what we say will make a difference in every man's life here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, this is a, a little story somebody sent along to me. I was standing in front of the bedroom mirror looking uh, myself over, rather unhappy with what I saw. I told my wife, I feel horrible. I look fat. I'm ugly. When did my hair start retreating like this? When did this stretch mark show up? I could use a compliment, sweetheart. Uh, my self-esteem is in the dumps. She looked at me and replied, well, your eyesight seems to be daggone pretty good. <laughs> so the question is, how is your faith, your spiritual eyesight? Everything in your life for now and eternity depends on whether you have 20-20 or not. So the question is today, how do you know how do you know for sure if you're going to make heaven? And how do you know if you know you're going to make heaven, should you live now, between now and the time you make heaven? Someone said, uh, all we can really know for sure about the future is death and taxes. And that's probably pretty true. So there's a graveyard I read about in New England. <clears throat> this is the inscription on the gravestone. Here lies John Sears. Born 1850, died 1900, buried 1925. Point being, there are a lot of dead people walking around that haven't been buried yet. You can be dead this morning or this noonday in this room and not know it. And my thesis is, having worked with men now for 46 years around the country, that there are a lot of dead men. They just don't know it. They take a shower, they put good clothes on, they rock and roll, they do their routine, they make love, they do all kinds of stuff, but they're dead. The story that gets this over is a Danish philosopher tells the story of a spider who dropped a single strand down from the top rafter of an old barn and began to weave his web. Days and weeks and months went by and the web grew. It uh, regularly provided the spider with food, flies, mosquitoes, small insects were caught in this elaborate maze. The spider built his web larger and larger until it became the envy of all the other spiders. One day, this productive spider was traveling across his beautifully woven web and noticed a single strand all the way up into the darkness into the rafters. He said, I wonder what, what's up there, he thought. He doesn't ser it doesn't serve any purpose. It doesn't give me another dinner. After saying that, the spider climbed up as high as he could and severed the single strand that was his sustenance. When he did, the entire web slowly began to tumble to the floor of the barn, taking the spider with it. And this is exactly, I believe, what happens to every one of us when the strand is broken to the God that made us and the God that sent his son to die for us and wants to live in us. That's exactly what happens. So every basic screw up that we make in life happens because the strand is broken. So here's the biggest question I think any of us can ever have in front of us. Are you dead or alive? And if you're dead, how do you get alive? 
So I'm just not going to kind of dance through a bunch of little things. I'm going to give you a passage of Scripture in a couple moments. I'm going to go through it verse by verse because I don't make anything happen. The Word is alive and real. The author of the Word says, the Bible, and he's the one that changes people's lives. I can't persuade you. I could tell jokes. I could cry. I could do all these things to try to persuade you. For a lot of you, it won't move you one inch closer to God. So I'm going to go back to the book and let the book do the job. There are two kinds of men in this room. There are men who are alive, and there are men that are dead. There are men that are living because they're alive, and there are other men here that are just existing. Some of you are kind of like the rat on the wheel. You're just going around and around and around and around, and you get weary of it. You keep going and don't know why you're going, but you don't know how to get off. You don't know how to call a timeout and stop and find something that's more fulfilling with deep meaning and purpose in it. If you're alive, if you're alive because of the strand and you're hooked to him, you know it. If you're dead and not hooked to him, Interestingly enough, you may not know it. You can be dead faith-wise, spiritually, and not know it. If you are alive, then you have a relationship with the God of the universe through His Son, Jesus Christ. If you're dead, you don't have that relationship. It's simple as that, but as profound as that. Nelson Bell, who used to be a great missionary years ago to China, was speaking at a banquet. He was asked to pray... And he said, made this remark before he prayed. He looked out at the audience and he said, listen, folks, there are two kinds of people here today. Those who are in a relationship with Jesus Christ and those who are not. And if you aren't, get it settled before you leave. And that is my challenge to you. You don't need to waste another day without a relationship with Christ and not just so you can get your ticket punched, get your sins forgiven, so you can get a promise for heaven. By the way, none, none of us ever know when we're going to go. Gary Lindsley didn't know his day was the day he went. Oh, he was dealing with some stuff physically. You don't know. I don't know. Today may be my day. Are you ready? That's what I want to know. We're all either dead or alive. So I want you to make that decision. I want you to know. So in Ephesians chapter number two, the Ephesians uh, in the second chapter, the apostle Paul, the great apostle Paul who wrote a good portion of the New Testament in the Bible, who once was a Jew killing Christians who came to Christ in Acts chapter nine, is talking to these people in this town called Ephesus who had become followers of Jesus. So he's looking to the past, and this is what he's saying. If you look at the screen, you'll see the passage. The first thing he says in verse 1, and you were dead. Now what in the heck is he talking about? What does it mean to be dead? What he's saying here is that your greatest need is to see where you came from or where you are presently. And as we look in our country, so, so two guys in a car run over a policeman, come up behind, and smash him, and he's gone. And we can sit here the rest of the day that we, with the, dis, the, the disrespect of authority and the craziness like I've never seen in all my life in this country. And we look at everything to change it. More education, more morality, more sophistication, more economic advantage. That's going to change it. That doesn't change squat. What we got to have is a changed heart. And it's out of the heart that a man operates and thinks and acts, etc., and decides. That is the key. And so how do you change the heart? Our greatest need is to overcome deadness. And there are all kinds of signs of deadness. I'm going to give you a few here now. So he's talking to these people, and he's saying in Ephesus, many of you were dead now because of Christ, and we'll show you in a minute how he comes to that conclusion. Now you're alive. So what does it mean to be dead? Physically, it means to be dead that you can't respond to life. Around the corner at Sparkman Hillcrest, there's a plaque in the ground in one area where my little baby lies. Little Adrian was born um, years ago, went nine months. My wife's still in the hospital. She's getting ready to come out with that little baby, that little girl. 
I get a phone call about seven or eight at night from a nurse at Presbyterian Hospital, and she said, you need to get over here, baby's struggling. She had picked up a germ in the hospital. The next day, they move her to another hospital to somebody that's supposed to be able to perform what she needed, and he told me, I'll never forget, he said, I'm going to do everything I can to save your baby. But she didn't make it. Little Adrian, after she died, you could have poked her, pushed her, or whatever, but she was not going to respond to that stimuli. Why? Because when you're dead, you cannot respond to life. When you're dead spiritually, you cannot respond. And some of you are here today, and all your life, you've fought against guys like me, with messages like me. And that is just a sign of your deadness. You're tipping your hat. You can't respond. And I'll tell you how you can respond in a minute. When you're dead, you're dead. You can't respond. Spiritually, it's the same. You can't respond to his love. Now, the word dead here means doomed forever. It ain't good. So take that one to bed tonight and think about it. I'm doomed forever. If you're dead, you're doomed. That means you're cut off from God, and you're going to live in the opposite place from where he wants you to be with him, and it ain't going to be pretty. And when you make that decision, and you go to the wrong place someday, you will know you are there, and you will know you missed him. And it ain't going to be pretty. You know what I've found over the years? I've seen many, many men come to Christ. I've seen many men walk away and never come to him. It takes great humility to say, I have a need. you got to be humble. And to me, there's nothing uglier than a person that's not humble. So are you a humble man? So what do what spiritually dead people do? Well, physically, they can still breathe. They may be halfway moral. They may do good things. Biologically, they can function. Their activities, though, are doomed. And if you go on in the passage, in verse number one, it says, because of their disobedience, in other words, transgressions, and their many sins. So here's the here's point I want you to get. If you are a liar, if you lie, it's because you're a liar. If you cheat, it's because you're a cheater. You say, what do you mean? In Psalm 51.5, it says we are born with a sinful nature. You're born with it. You don't want to acquire it after you're born. When you're born, you come with that. So if you lie, it's because you're a liar. In other words, I do what I do because I am what I am. Sometimes you do stuff to you. That's just not like me. No, it's just exactly like us. <laughs> but we got to understand where all this came from. It didn't just come out of, the, out of the sky someplace. There's a history to it. The word transgression or disobedience means to slip, to fall, to stumble, or to go in the wrong direction. And the word sins here is a hunting term. A lot of you guys like hunting. And it means to miss the mark. To miss the mark of what God wants for your life. Romans 3.23, the scripture says, For God so loved the world. That's John 3.16. We're going to get to that. But in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and missed the mark of what God wants and expects. Sin is basically, I believe, a disease. There's something in you and me that causes you and me to want to do what you and me want to do. And by golly, I'm going to do it. Ain't nobody going to tell me anything. Well, go right on and see where that ends up. Love to see your marriage. I bet that's fun. So here's God who's perfect. We're imperfect. We're separated and unplugged from him. The strand has been broken, and everything is impacted by that. I'm cut off from God, myself, and others, and it's a nightmare. Remember, please remember this. Dead men, people that don't come to Jesus, can still care and do good and be a good person. In fact, I know people that aren't followers of Jesus that are more philanthropic and more gracious and kind and respectful and giving than some Christians I know. You say, how is that possible? Because every man, whether they know Jesus or not, have been made in the image of God, therefore had the capability of doing good things. Doesn't mean they're going to heaven, 
but they're made in His image, even though it's marred and scarred, you can still get, do good things. So the problem is sinful man and a holy God do not come together. Oil and water do not mix. So we got a problem. Environmentally, look at verse number two now. And I'm not going to cover all this, so don't, don't uh, wiggle in your seat. You used to live, he's talking about the people in Ephesus, before you came to Christ, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world. And the world here, the word means the world system in Dallas, Texas today, apart from God, the world's way of thinking and the world's way of acting, which most of us are manipulated by every day. If you ever stop and just think, I wonder how much, why do I do what I do? And you'll go see somewhere, see there's something you watch, somebody said something, something to your advantage. If you act a certain way, it's coming and dictated by the world around you. The non-believing world way of thinking, the worldview of the world. So we need to see that we're living in a closed system. A closed system, some people believe, and you'll see it on the screen, we got this person representing mankind in this circle. And the philosophy here is that you believe, if you believe this world system and closed system, is that there's no way to get out. I'm stuck. I'm screwed. And number two, there's no way if there's anything out there like God that can get in. Let me tell you something. Um, if that's your philosophy and you think, well, I'm just going to fly off one day and turn into a a puddle of dust, and that's it. That's all life's all about. I feel sorry for you because there really is more, and I want you to know that more. But not only that, if you look in verse number two, it goes on to say that just like the rest of the world obeying the devil, the command of the powers of the unseen world, he is at the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey him. And you say, oh, now he's getting that devil stuff. That's Satan. See, that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. Dismiss it. You ought to read C.S. Lewis's book, Screw Tape Letters, sometime. One of the most brilliant thinkers and writers of all time. See what he said about it. There is a real enemy that wants to eat your lunch and my lunch and trip us up and not do what God wants us to do. The scripture says in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He's after your marriage, he's after your kids, he's after your grandkids, he's after your friendships, he's after everything. Go over and read Ephesians chapter 6 sometime and see what it is. You see, the problem is less than 20% of the people in this room read their Bible once a week. So we don't even know what the operation manual says. Everything I'm giving you, you have access to it 24 hours a day. But the reason I speak about it is I, call, I know people don't open it up. Or even if they know. I was meeting with a guy one time a couple years ago. And he said he really wanted to get his life together. I said, are you reading your Bible? He sa I said, do you have one? Yeah, he said, yeah, it's in my garage somewhere. <laughs> are you freaking kidding me? Some of you probably, yours might be in the, you may not even have one in the garage. So the dead man doesn't have a relationship with Christ obeys, whether he knows it or not, the enemy. You are an instrument in the hands, the Bible says, of the enemy and may not even know it. Now, is that where you want to land up? You want that on your curriculum vitae? You want that to be what people know about you? You're, you're, you're a part of the team, the enemy's team. And then you look at verse number three, and he said, here's the lifestyle. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires, inclinations of our sinful life, our very nature. We were subjects to wrath, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So what this is saying is to the people in Ephesus and to us today, if we've not made the shift in relationship with him right, he says, you're, you're a slave. What are you a slave to? Desires, passions, and thoughts of the world. Desires, passions toward the drives for something forbidden. Passion, strong, evil desire. Thoughts, godless thoughts. So just when we think we're grown up and, and boy, I'm free, if you're not following him, you're a slave to the enemy and to these passions. 
And it's not pretty. And all of us have, all of us have been hooked to some of these things over the years. Nobody is exempt. But then he goes on and he says, what's your status? In the last part of that, he says, and he says, by our very nature, we were subject to God's wrath or anger. Now, what's this whole thing about wrath and anger? It means that I, if I don't have a relationship with him, with Christ, I am literally living in the rawness of what I call deadness. A righteous God has, if he stays righteous throughout his being, has to deal with those things that are opposite of him. If you're dead, your deadness will impact everything in your life. If you're a father, it will impact that. Your marriage, it will impact that. Your friendships, your work, uh, your generosity, your thought or lack of it, your thoughts, your health, it will impact everything in your life. If you're dead, you can look alive, but inside. And some of you know you're missing something. Some of you probably thought, you know, I know I'm missing something. Pascal said there's a, there's a God-shaped vacuum in every man's heart that only he can fill. So the question then becomes, is there any hope? Do I have any hope at all? Answer, you betcha. And I'm here to deliver the hope. Sometimes you can't really appreciate the hope until you see the hopelessness. Sometimes you can't see the good offer and the life until you see the negative, the dead. In the Bible, it always moves through the negatives to get to the positives. If we don't understand how bad it really is, we may not want what the offer is. That's why I'm doing this. So, we have hope. A Jewish man said this, when you are dead, you go six feet under, and that's it. End of story. I've literally talked to people like that. It's over, it's over, it's over. Let me tell you, you're going to be in for a rude awakening someday, if that's your philosophy. So let's go on here. What's the present like? Look at the verse 4 and 5. He says, but God, oh, any time in the Bible you see the word but, look at the buts, not B-U-T-T, but the B-U-T. But God, so rich in mercy, he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Now listen to this. The word mercy here is a powerful word. God's anger and he has every right to wipe us out right now if we're dead and don't have a relationship with him. But what holds back that anger? Mercy. So here comes the anger intercepted by God's mercy. Now let me tell you something, friends. You need to think about that. If you've not come to him, if you're not walking with him, he's holding it back. But he has the choice to let that anger loose anytime he wants and wipe any of us out. And that's the story. That is absolutely phenomenal news. He says, but God, the mercy, the love, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How do you beat that? When did he come and give his son? When we had it all together? When we're going to church every week, you don't have to go to church, by the way, to become a Christian. I know a lot of people that go to church thinking that that gives them the status of a Christian. It doesn't. You don't become a Christian anymore when you sit in the pew anymore than if you go in your garage this afternoon and sit in your car. You don't become a car. That's not how you get it. You don't get it through osmosis. Well, my granddaddy was a believer, and I just kind of passed it along to me. Doesn't work. Find that one in the book. It ain't in the book. Well, I'm a pretty good guy. Goodness doesn't do it. you got to be perfect. So we got a problem here. When we were helpless, when we were slobs, when we were absolutely selfish and a nightmare, Jesus came. He came when we were at our worst, and he gave us his best. Now, what you have to decide, and what we all have to decide, is this Jesus thing true or not? Because if he literally lived, died, rose from the dead, 
And if that is fact, that changes everything. That is the issue. It's not whether the Bible's true, any of that. I believe it is. But if Jesus lived, died, rose from the dead, if he put his stamp on this and said it's true, then I can take it. So that's what you've got to figure out. And I'm telling you, he is who he claimed to be. So when we couldn't do anything, he did everything. And you know what? None of us deserve that. I think sometimes we think we do God a favor if we give our life to him. He said, boy, man, come on, you really are a bad, a bad case. Are you kidding me? Some people say, well, I don't need that. He says, some people say, well, I'll just wait. I'll wait, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll figure out how to get there on my own. Well, good luck on that one. There's got to be another way to get to heaven other than this Jesus. Well, I'm too educated. I've been to educated. I've been to Texas A&M, University of Texas, went to Rice. You know, I got some, some of us are dying by degrees. I'm not that bad. Well, I'll put it off. Listen, put, if you put it, not to decide is to decide. You've made your decision. And that is a very precarious position to be in. So what about the future? Well, look at verse 6. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future, here's the future, ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ. Are you united with Christ? That's the question. So what makes a person a Christ one? I don't use the word Christian much because there's too much baggage that goes with it. I like to use a follower of Jesus. How many of you know that you're following him? So here's the question. What makes a person a Christian? Jesus living in you, period. Not doing good stuff, not giving things away. He makes you what you are. And then once he's in you, then he begins to transform you. Some of you say, that's the problem. I think he's going to send me to Boodle Boodle Land someplace, and I don't want to go over there. I want to play golf. Let me tell you, whatever he does in you, it's going to be better than anything ever done in you in your life. Ever. So how do you come alive? Thank him. Tell him you're dead. Confess your mess. Receive him and his gift of life. And follow him. It's not real complicated. But look at that next verse. And we're winding this down here. But look at that next verse. This is really good. So <clears throat> the scripture says. Ooh, I thought I lost one of my pages. And it just magically appeared. Look at verse 8 and 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And that's what I'm challenging you to do now. If you believe something, you're going to act on it and rely on it and give yourself to it. And you can't take credit for this, he says. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast or brag. See, that, that'll humble you. Well, I thought I, thought I kind of earned my way there. Nah, -uh. nah that's, that's not how it works. But then look at verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. It's a little Greek word called poiema. God's highest work of creation. So let me end with a story and then give you final, one final challenge. Listen closely. On a uh, tour of a paper factory, uh, the queen, Queen Victoria, saw old rags uh, through a window. The foreman didn't realize that this was the queen. He allowed her, not knowing she was the queen, to come into the rag room where the refuse of the city was brought and dumped. The queen asked, what's the purpose of all these rags? The man said, well, it's from uh, these that the most delicate and finest white paper will be processed and produced. After she left, the foreman finally recognized and realized that the queen had been there. Some days later, the queen received a parcel containing a bundle of the most delicate paper produced in the factory. When she held it up to the light, the water press or print 
on the paper was her image, the image of the queen. She realized that this beautiful paper had been made from the refuse of the city. When you come to Christ, he takes a mess. And I think sometimes we really don't know how bad we are. We really don't. And he makes out of that mess something valuable and beautiful. In fact, he calls it a masterpiece. Let me tell you something. This whole thing about grace and him offering his son and forgiveness and new life and living someday with him forever. Let me, let me give you a statement about grace. Today's grace, today, doesn't represent an eternal opportunity. One day, God will draw the line and close the door. So if you uh, know Christ and you know he lives in you, thank God. If you're not sure about that, and you, or you know he's not in you, I'm going to pray a little prayer. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. You can leave your eyes open if you want to, or you can close your eyes. But just pray this little prayer. It's to help. There's no magic in the words. It's simply to help you uh, make this decision. So if you desire to do it, pray after me. Dear Lord, I'm tired of being dead. Existing, not living. Thank you for providing a way for me to overcome my deadness. Thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for me. Come into my life now. Forgive me. Clean me up. Make me come alive. And from this moment forward, Help me to become the man you've always wanted me to be. Gentlemen, whether you know or not or feel it or not, according to the word of God, which is true throughout, he now lives in you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Forever he's there. You couldn't kick him out if you wanted to. That's how secure this is. I hope this has been a good day for some of you because this, this is the day. <laughs> this is the day. And I encourage you and urge you next week to be here because I'm going to tell all of us how to take the next steps once he has come into our lives, whether it's been in the past or whether it's been today. Okay? Well, Lord, thanks for our time together. And I particularly want to thank you again for Bo Estes and Tom for celebrating the life of Gary by supporting a couple tables and getting some of their buddies and people and friends here. And thank you for the life of Gary. And the reason, Lord, we love him so much is because he loved us and he was able to love us because you loved him and lived in his life. And now I pray, Lord, for those who ask you to come in today, and I pray that they would begin to take the next steps to develop and grow in that intimate relationship with you. In Jesus' name. And before I say amen, if you prayed that prayer today, please, please send me a note, write me a note on your table, give me, put it up on the table here, my visiting with people, and I'll send you something, I'll give you something to help you to begin to grow. Okay? Amen. amen. Thank you.